Well, it is right at noon, so we will go ahead and get started here with our um, barbecue basics training, or so you want to make barbecue. Um, it's our next installment in this series. Uh, Dr. Greg Renfro will be hosting today. This video will be recorded, so we will post it on YouTube and get it up there, so anyone can go back and check um, anything they may have missed or just rewatch again at they as they want. Um, but Dr. Renfro, I will give it over to you. All right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, really kind of ironic. Uh, over my shoulder, I'm actually broadcasting from over here in an empty office in the Good Barn. And I've got my crew out there uh, just outside the window here. They're they're getting the, the uh, grills fired up for uh, to cook hamburgers for our graduating seniors uh, today. So it's a kind of a timely topic to do this as well. But uh, it is that time of year when uh, everybody's fancy turns to uh, grilling out and barbecuing. Uh, some of us still barbecue year round, but for, for a lot of folks, uh, it's the when, we, when the trees start getting green and the grass needs to be mowed, it's about time to dust off the, the grill and, and, uh, and grill out or smoke or whatnot. And so we're going to talk about the differences between grilling and smoking and what things can we grill, what things should we smoke, and and it's a good thing we are uh, recording this because at the end, I've got a few recipes that you might want to uh, uh, go back and rewatch these and copy those down because they're pretty cool recipes as well. But just a little historical data or statistical data that we have here. Most households, it says 80% have a grill or a smoker or both. If you're like my uh, my neighbor, he's got a pellet grill, a a grill down by the uh, the patio uh, exiting his, his uh, basement. And then on his deck, he's got another grill and another smoker up there that overlooks his pool. So he's really uh, set up there. But the cool thing is, is 97% of the people actually grill. All right. And like I said earlier, what days do we grill? Well, Independence Day or Fourth of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day tends to be the uh, the big ones. You know, obviously Memorial Day is the official kickoff to uh the grilling season, but, you know, when we think about uh, where do we grill, obviously at home, but, you know, there's a lot of folks that go to tailgates for football games or even NASCAR races. I've been to quite a few NASCAR races in my time, and they there's not much difference between what they look like as far as grilling out at a, a NASCAR race than what you'd see at a college tailgate football game, just different. Instead of everybody wearing UK blue, you see a hodgepodge of, of uh Chase Elliott clothes and Brad Keselowski and Kyle Busch and so on and so forth. So we do grill out quite a bit. Uh, and it's really interesting, you know, again, you, you hear some statistics that kind of pop up there. Again, you know, burgers, steaks, chicken, hot dogs are the big ones we grill out. The popular flavors that we like when we grill is hickory, mesquite, honey, spicy, hot. You got to have a side. Potatoes, uh, I would venture to say that, that maybe that's potato salad. I don't know. Corn and other vegetables in there. But it's really kind of interesting if you look at this slide and you kind of read some of these uh, finer points in here. Uh, there's a lot of folks that that uh, use their grills year round. Um, it's really kind of interesting when you see there by the spatula, men are more apt to grill than women outside. And that's one of those things that even the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, you know, during the wintertime, their target audience is women. Then during the summertime, their target audience is men solely before, just solely for that grilling out phenomenon as well. So let's start, you know, let's just kind of take this little scroll through the grocery store and you, you're inspired. We got, we got some holidays coming up. We got the Kentucky Derby coming up. We got Memorial Day coming up and then 4th of July before long. And so you're in the grocery store and you're going to say, okay, we're going to throw something on the grill. And then you ask yourself, okay, what, Cuts can I grill, okay? So if you think about that live animal, and some of you that have heard me speak before, you've heard me talk about this phen phenomenon we call tenderness when it comes to meat. The muscles of locomotion and versus muscles of support. There's some muscles that that animal uses, regardless of if it's a beef or a pig or a lamb or chicken or whatnot, there are some muscles that that animal uses to move itself from point A to point B. Those muscles that we use, we call those obviously muscles of locomotion. 
they tend to have larger muscle fibers, kind of like when you go to the uh, gym and you lift weights, you're really hoping that you increase your muscle size. Well, you do that by increasing the size of your muscle fibers. And so, you you know, once you start increasing their size, you got to have more connective tissue as well. And so those muscles right there, those muscles of locomotion, they don't work very well for grilling. All right. And if you're going to quote unquote grill them, we'll talk about the difference between grilling and smoking here in a second. But if you're going to, you need to be, have an extremely low temperature for a long period of time. On the flip side, there are some muscles in that carcass that are solely used to support the skeleton. That's all their job is. They don't move the animal from one point to the next. Their sole job is to support the skeleton. Those support muscles can be grilled. In this definition we're going to be talking about here is grilling. They have smaller muscle fibers. They don't have as much connective tissue. So what does that mean when you're in the grocery store? All right. So if we look at our beef carcass here. Uh, if it has the name round or shoulder or claw in there, those words right there are chuck, all right? Words round, shoulder, clawed, or chuck, those are not good for grilling, but they're good for smoking, all right? Those cuts in the middle that have the names like loin or rib, they're good for grilling, Okay. And consequently, those ones that are good for grilling are your more tender cuts. And on the flip side, they're the ones that are worth more money in the grocery store. So those cuts that are good for grilling off of a beef carcass would be a ribeye, strip steak, porterhouse, filet mignon, T-bone, those names, all right, sirloin. Uh, same thing with pork, loin. Those are the ones you throw on the grill. The ones that you smoke and that you, you do a kind of a low and slow, those have the name, like we said earlier, round, shoulder cloth, chuck. Those are the ones that we, uh, uh, we have to cook differently as well. So we've been talking about grilling, all right? Grilling and smoking, those are two separate things. They're not the same, even though we like to use those terms interchangeably. Grilling is where we're doing things at a high temperature, short period of time. Go out, start the grill, throw the meat on there, and within 15, 20 minutes, you've got a meal, okay? Those are your support muscles. Those are your hamburgers. Those are your bratwurst. High temperature, short period of time. Smoking is longer. This is where we're using extremely low temperature temperatures, less than 225 degrees. We're letting that smoke penetrate that meat. It's a, it's a long period of time, 12 hours or more. Those are things like your brisket, which is a big muscle of locomotion. The Boston butt that we talk about in, in the pork carcass, that's the shoulder. Ribs, you say, well, I, does the ribs don't, they don't move the animal from one point to the next. They don't, but they're the, the rib cage flexing and relaxing is what helps the animal breathe. So they, they develop bigger muscle fibers as well. And so... Thinking about the grill versus a smoker, okay? And so you can see direct heat versus indirect heat. So when I'm, I'm grilling, I'm wanting direct heat. When I'm smoking, I'm wanting indirect heat. And this, this type of grill that you see in this cartoon is probably fairly familiar with you. I have one of these at home, and you can see down where the 500 degree area is, that's where I would want to grill, all right? That area there, or you could you could do it in the other part as well. But if you're you're doing this indirect heat, that's where you're going to put your fire is down down here in this bottom part, and then you're going to let the uh, the airflow pull that heat through there, and it's an indirect heat, slow way of cooking. These these work wonders. They're really good at uh, working this, all right? So now we got the meat. What type of wood do I use, all right? We like to use hardwoods, all right? And the reason why we like to use hardwoods, softwoods have a lot of stuff in there that doesn't taste good, all right? So avoid the pines, the junipers, those type of things. Uh, pressure treated wood, scrap wood, and so on and so forth. Those are gonna get that kind of creosote flavor that you don't want. So you're gonna have to get some hardwood. Hickory is the king of smoking wood. You can smoke every type of meat with hickory. It works well for all those, all right? Mesquite is another one. I've got a friend of mine down in Texas. We'll talk about her a little bit more as we go through this presentation. And so she's a big fan of mesquite because she's from South Texas, and that's what they, 
she grew up on is mesquite uh, embarks a lot of sweet flavors and it it is it does work well for all types of red meat as well then we got some of these woods that work better for pork and for poultry doesn't work as well for for beef all right apple all right apple is really good for both pork and poultry gives you it's a lighter uh, wood gives you more fruity flavors to your meat as well alder's the same thing if you're into smoking fish alder works well for salmon cherry maple those are really good for smoking uh, pork and poultry as well oak now here in kentucky oak takes on a different connotation because sometimes those bourbon barrels that have reached the end of their life. They're they've been beat up too much, and they're not they're not going to be sent off to go put other whiskeys in or scotches or anything like that. They could be shredded up and used for smoking. They work well. They have a little bit of that that whiskey still left in there. But other people will smoke with oak, uh, especially when we get into beef briskets. That's this friend of mine I was telling you about. That's from South Texas. Post oak is a big thing. I've I've. Uh, Asked for advice from a, uh, from another colleague of mine at Texas A and M. They do a brisket school down at Texas A and M, and he talks about the only thing they use is post oak. All right, and then you get down into the couple of pecan and grapevines. All right, I, I did a little bit of time in Missouri when I was working on my PhD. Missouri uh, is a number two wine producing state, so they have a lot of grapevines. Man, those things work really well for smoking poultry. And pecan does the same as well. So whatever you're using, make sure you, you mash up the right wood. A quick internet search will tell you if I'm doing pork, you know, yeah, I can use hickory and mesquite, but maybe expand out into the apple, the alders, the cherry, and the maple to help with your pork flavors. Or if you're smoking fish, there's other woods that you can use for fish other than alder as well. All right. So now we got our meat. We got our wood that we're going to use. What grill or smoker should I use? And holy smokes, there is a big variety of these guys out here. Uh, the old standby, the Weber kettle looking grill over here. That's the old standby. A lot of people use that for grilling. I have heard a lot of people use that for smoking as well. It takes a little bit more management with that. Uh, then you got the guy next to him is the Big Green Egg or the uh, Komodo Joe is another version of that. Those are those kind of uh, terracotta type uh, smoker cookers in there. They do really good about reflecting heat and holding heat. I've been told that you can actually bake a pie in one of those as well. Very expensive. All right. Uh, very high dollar. Then you get into the pellet grills, whether that's a Traeger or a uh, Pit Boss. Those pellet grills kind of double as both a smoker and a grill, although I would argue that they do a better job smoking than they do grilling. Um, some folks, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm the same way. I've got uh, two of these, you know. Uh, I got one that's just grill and one that's a, the, the smoker, the pellet grill. So those are pretty common as well. Then you kind of graduate up or, or lateral move over to these kind of direct in, in heat, indirect heat type grills here. I've got one of these, they work wonders. You just start your fire down here for smoking and then you got a good draw that comes up through here to the chimney there. So you get that good indirect heat. You can grill from here. I, I usually grill from here as well. And this area, the bigger area as well, you can do either or with those. It's kind of a good all purpose one, but again, it, it requires a little bit more maintenance. And then if you really want to go to the NASCAR race or you really want to go to the UK football game and tailgate and impress, I guarantee you pull up with this guy right here and on a trailer and you start smoking and cooking and everything else and grilling with that thing, you're going to you're going to draw a, a big crowd because those are kind of cool things that uh, it is everything you see above you on wheels and, and they're portable and a lot of folks like those. Your big competition smokers and grillers and barbecue competition guys, that's kind of what they use and they have their own styles that they use as well. And then if you really want to get technical, you can have what we use at the Meats Lab. This is a smokehouse, all right? This is a, not a real big smokehouse. It only holds about five, six, seven hundred pounds of meat. But this is this is the next, the the ultimate level, I, I should say. This is what a lot of your meat processors have when they make hams and bacons and smoked sausages and summer sausage and things like this, is they 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 double as a smoker, they double as a uh, as a cooker, as an oven. 
uh, highly computerized, highly sophisticated, and so on. The problem of it is that these require a lot of space and they are a ton of money. If you're going to buy one of these Enviro packs right now, you're talking probably 200,000 plus for the setup that we have in this one in the meat slab. Uh, but that's, that's that's the super de duper professional guys. Your meat processors have one of those. Probably not something you want for your at home, but I'll throw that in there just to brag. All right. Then if you really, really, really get serious, we took this picture when we were at a conference in Wisconsin. This is the Johnsonville. You've probably seen this in the, some of their commercials. It is their grill on a semi, all right? You can see there's several grills through there. So that's when you get a little bit too serious in your, your outdoor uh, culinary experience right there. And then I had to throw this guy in here uh, not quite a grill, not kind of smoker. It's a griddle, uh, but we're seeing these these the uh, flat top griddle. Blackstone is the uh, is the brand name that a lot of people see out there. Uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, you could replicate this inside. We've done it for eons, but for some weird reason, you move this outside and everything tastes a lot better outside. I was spent the last uh, few days trying to put this talk together, and I've been on the fence about having one of these black stones on my deck. And after doing this and talking to some folks, I, I'm, I'm sold. I, I think it's time to tell my wife I want a black stone for Father's Day. So I don't know if that'll happen or not. They're they're uh, they're 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 kind of proud of them when it comes to the price, but they're another way of cooking outdoors as well. And if you like Hank Hill, I'm a big fan of Hank Hill. He always gets in the argument of propane and propane accessories and propane being better than charcoal. There's some positives and negatives to both of them. Obviously, charcoal is more authentic. It's more of that primal fire that you see there. And boy, if you, you catch Lowe's or Sam's Club or any store on the right time, you can pick up a couple bags of charcoal pretty cheap that lasts you quite a while as well. So those are the positives using charcoal. Propane, on the other hand, boy, it's faster. You don't have to manage it. You turn it on, you get you get the flow set right in, in the, the amount of gas that you got going into the, the grill, and you can turn it on and leave it, all right? Negatives, charcoal's messy. Boy, you get black stuff all over you. It's slower. It takes about 20, 30, 40 minutes to get that dude up to uh, up to temperature where you can do anything. So it's slower. Propane, on the other hand, it's not as authentic. All right. You remember the episode of King of the Hill where Hank tried to enter into the Texas State uh, Fair barbecue competition and they didn't have a propane category, you know, because it's it's not as authentic as the hardwood smokers are uh, either as well. But they are higher priced. So there's positives and negatives for this. So which one's the better one? It ends up just being a personal preference. All right. Some folks like the convenience and the quickness of the propane. Others prefer the charcoal and so on. It's a personal preference. Uh, you know, so whatever works for you, whatever you enjoy, that's the one you need. That's the one you need. So here's some grilling and smoking tips that we have for you. Oh my goodness! You, if you're a if you're a barbecue connoisseur, you know exactly what this is. This is that pink uh, layer that you see on this brisket here. That's called a smoke ring, and that's developed with a combination of things: the myoglobin that's in the muscle. That's the myoglobin is the the protein uh, that makes the uh, the red colored pigment that makes beef red and pork pink and so on and so forth. It's that and some nitric oxide uh, causing coming from the 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 wood that's being used to smoke binding with that and some carbon monoxide as well that's in that and all that reaction over a slow long period of time and you get this smoke ring and there's a lot of your barbecue people that will tell you that a smoke ring a nice smoke ring on the outside of a piece of meat shows you that it was properly smoked and properly cooked and so on and so forth. Does it make a difference in flavor? Uh, that, 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 is, uh, that is still debatable. Scientifically, no. Uh, but uh, those, are, those people that are in the church of barbecue, they will swear by that smoke ring. But if you're not familiar with authentic barbecue, that can really kind of, you know, set some people off that smoke ring on they think it's raw or there's something wrong with it that's why you see a lot of your barbecue restaurants have a way of describing that smoke ring on there and they take pride in having that smoke ring on there because in their minds 
That is a properly cooked piece of meat. So smoking basics, all right? If you're going to do this, obviously you have to have the right type of wood. You have to have the right type of smoker as well. You got to realize it's going to take time. So if you've heard me uh, in the past, you've heard me say that if you want brisket for dinner tonight, you should have started cooking it last night, okay? So it takes time to smoke. It's not a, uh, it's not a uh, just do it and have it for dinner tonight. It is an indirect heat. It is a slow period. You need to make sure you got good airflow. You need to make sure your smoker is clean, especially if you do these over a longer period of times. That creosote built up in your inside your smoker can cause some bitter flavor. So you need to make sure that number one, you got good uh, airflow. Number two, your smoker is clean. Make sure you've got plenty of time to do this as well. So because it is, it's one of those things that that a lot of people will grill through the week and then on special occasions they'll smoke. You know, they, they take that long period of time to do that as well. If you're grilling, all right, this is what you know come home and bust something out on the grill sounds good tonight. You can do that. One thing you got to you gotta understand, all right? Number one, you know, we like to put flavor on there. All right. And so sometimes it's it's a simple salt, pepper, and garlic powder is a very basic seasoning. You can mix those three together, equal parts. They will they will season anything and everything. Beef, pork, lamb, chicken, whatnot you throw on there. I will say this, the, the, the fresher that product is, the better it is. Uh, if, if you're like me, you can go into your spice cabinet and you probably got spices there that you, you've been moving ever since you're in college, all right? They probably don't have any flavor left. It's time to donate them back to na nature as well. Sometimes you're going to want to put some sort of marinade in there. And you got to know your marinations. Uh, if it if you grab a bottle of marinade at your grocery store and it says marinate for 30 minutes, that's just a flavoring marinade, all right? Other marinades we can use not only add flavor, but they have some sort of acid in them that's going to help break down that connective tissue and make things uh, even more tender as well. So those are usually your longer marinades for, for several hours at a time. So make sure you're picking up the right marinade. Again, if it just says marinade for 30 minutes that's just a flavor marinade it says for optimal marination 10 to 12 hours that's usually going one that's going to break down the connective tissue in there and make your meat a little bit more tender there i am not a fan of steak sauce all right my daughter has has entered that phase in her life where she likes to be uh, rebellious and so she likes to tease me at a steakhouse with steak sauce all right and then we don't talk to each other for a couple of days but uh you know Steak sauce is wonderful for some products, just for a nice steak. Why would you want to cover the flavor? That's just me. That's just me. Always, you know, that's the one thing I mentioned earlier that uh, the kids in the meat lab are outside getting ready to grill hamburgers for the uh, for their, our graduating seniors. And food safety is is always on our minds when we do this. Everybody's wearing gloves. We have a hand wash station. Uh, we try to keep the the uh, the the uncooked portion uh, uh, well away from the cooked portion and so on and so forth. So food safety is something we always keep in mind. And it doesn't matter whether I'm just grilling for my family at home or it's a family reunion and I'm grilling and smoking for that as well. Uh, we got to make sure that we keep food safety in mind. Um, we uh, every year they say we have over nine million cases of foodborne illness, and they're, they're, that number might be a little bit low, to be honest with you. We're also heading into that time of year where we start to see a spike in foodborne illness, and it's mainly because everybody's outside, we're outside picnicking and grilling and so on. And so, what ends up happening is you have a a container of potato salad and you have your coleslaw and your meats and stuff like that. You eat dinner and you go out and you play basketball, volleyball, softball or something like that. And in two or three hours later, you come back and you're hungry, you fix another plate. Well, all the while, all that product that should have been warm got cold and all that product that should have been cold got warm and just became an area where, uh, you know, we get in that wheelhouse between 40 and 140 degrees for bacterial growth, and that's how we, we make ourselves sick. Or the other thing is where the cross-contamination comes into play, where I take the meat out on a uh, plate and put it on the grill, and then I don't clean that plate, and I just put all the cooked meat back on 
that plate. And so I, I reintroduced bacteria there as well. And so basically when we're talking about, you know, picnicking and food safety, keep the hot foods hot and the cold foods cold. And I understand, you know, people are going to watch this, people listening to it now, you're probably saying, well, aren't you just pre preaching common sense? I thought everybody knew that, but I heard Glenn Beck say this one time, and I think he's absolutely right. There's nothing common about common sense anymore. So this is why we always have to remind people on these types of things as well. So if we're going to grill out those steaks and chops, whether it's a beef steak or a uh, pork chop or something along those lines, remember reiterating what we did earlier, make sure we're doing only the loin, make sure we're only doing things left from the rib as well. Those are because we're talking about direct heat. You can see in the in the GIF file here where you can see the heat underneath there. So this, this chop's not very far from there. Um, but we also don't want it to be too hot. You know, uh, you know, if you can't hold your hand over it or it's burning your fingers when you're trying to flip your burgers, that might be a little bit too hot for your steaks and your burgers there. You know, even though we say this is a little bit quicker method, we still want to enjoy the process. We don't want it to get too hot. All right. If you can hold your hand over that, those those coals for a good three, maybe four seconds, that's probably an optimum time. You know, you want to just get enough to in there to where we slowly cook these, but not as slow as we're doing with the smoking. But but grilling the shops and make sure we're not too uh too uh too hot. Now, one thing I like to do, and, and a chef friend taught me this is put the piece of meat on there, no seasoning whatsoever. Put it on there, and once you start to see the juices start to pop up to the other surface, that's the time to flip it. And when you flip that steak, then you put your seasoning on that steak there. So what you're doing is layering flavor. So you got the flavor of meat, the flavor of that charred surface, that caramelized, you know, Maillard reaction, and then the seasoning on top of there as well. And then when you get to your de desired degree of doneness, that's when you pull those steaks and chops off of there, all right? And then you season the other side as well. And so the one thing you gotta realize is if you like your steaks medium rare, you probably need to pull them off at, me at, uh, at rare uh, rather than medium rare because you got some still heat built up inside there. So they will jump up another degree of doneness. So, so if you like a medium rare, you pull it off a medium rare, let the steak rest, which you should always do is let those steaks rest. It will cook itself up to medium. And so you've already kind of cooked it outside of your, your uh, preferred degree of doneness there. So keep that in mind when we talk about that carryover heat. And also let your steaks rest, pull them off the grill, let them rest three to five minutes there. Let the cooking kind of calm down. And that way, you know, you know, you keep the juices inside there as well. But it also helps those steaks to gain more flavor as well as when we let those guys rest. So you say, well, you know, degree of doneness, all right? You know, yeah, you can take a, a thermometer and stick in there and monitor it that way. But every time you stick it and you pull that thermometer out, you create a hole and those juices come out. So you end up making your product a little bit drier. So what chefs do is this touch method. And so you can see I have in this kind of uh, this, these pictures here. And so if I hold my hand out and I touch the ball of my hand, all right, that's rare. And I do the okay sign with the my thumb and in, index finger and touch that, you know, with just a little bit of pressure between the uh, the thumb and index finger. That's medium rare, and you keep moving your fingers over until you get to medium well and well done. And what a lot of people talk about is the tip of your nose being well done. So if it feels like the tip of your nose being well done, uh, it is well done, I should say. Uh, but you can see all the way over there is, you know, with your pinky is, uh, is, is well done. So that's what a lot of, that's what chefs do. They don't put a thermometer in there. They actually use the touch method of determining the degree of doneness with your steaks and chops. So what if you put that in there, all right? Rare is usually uh, about 120 to 130 degrees. You can see as we go up the list there, the higher that internal temperature gets, all right? Now, I realize, all right, I'm gonna I'm take time and, and get on my soapbox a little bit here. Uh, as Americans, we tend to overcook everything. Uh, I am a medium rare guy myself. I like to cook all my steaks medium rare. I like to cook my pork either to medium rare to medium. 
Uh, and you say, oh, aren't you supposed to thoroughly cook pork? Yes, you are supposed to thoroughly cook pork. That's the old wives' tale. But we don't have the issues with trichina that we used to in pork, all right? So if you're just using traditional pork you buy at a grocery store, you can get by with eating it medium, and you're going to be okay. Uh, in fact, that's why the uh, National Pork Board and the National Pork Producers Council, they've adjusted their recommended cooking temperatures to reflect that as well. The more you cook that, the higher degree of doneness you get, the more you cook the uh, moisture out of that steak and the more you cook the fat out of that steak. And everybody tells me the same thing every time. Why don't you like your steaks medium rare? I don't like the blood. That's not blood in there. That's just that water myoglobin. Remember the smoke ring we talked about a few slides ago? That's where that myoglobin, all right? Those, that raw piece of meat is about 70 to 75% water. And so what you're seeing when you cut into that steak and that fluid comes out, it's just water and myoglobin leaching out of there. It's not blood, all right? And trust me, the blood's been removed within the first 20 to 30 seconds after that animal's done when we begin the conversion of, of muscle to meat. So you can have that, all right? Now, ground beef, we do not recommend ground beef at that medium medium well we usually want ground beef to be well done or to well you know we want it to be in a, those upper degrees because they have more surface area and we want to make sure we get that internal temperature high enough so that if there is any type of pathogen inside there we killed it as well so uh be cautious when you cook all right so that you pull those steaks off ahead of time one thing i love I really enjoy this i'm a big fan of ribs pork ribs oh my goodness i don't you know you, you, I love pork ribs, but you will rarely ever see me eating pork ribs in public. I'll eat them with my family, uh, and, you know, my wife and my daughter, but in public, you're not going to see me in a restaurant eating pork ribs. Why? Because you got to do what this guy's doing right here. If you're going to, if you're going to do a good job eating pork ribs, you got to get in there and wallow. And I just don't want to look that way in, in public. And so pork ribs are fun. They're fun to eat. They're really uh, fun to uh, to make as well. Uh, they don't normally take as much time during the smoking process as we're going to make a, a brisket, but you can actually cook beef ribs as well. And that's become a kind of a big thing as well. So pork ribs, when we think about ribs, we think of pork ribs. And it seems to me that if I'm going to get ribs, oh my goodness, you, you know, if you're in Memphis, you have got to have Memphis style ribs. All right. You got to go to Memphis, have Memphis style ribs. Uh, Memphis is famous for the ribs. Kansas City's famous for the ribs as well, but I would all argue that Kansas City's more famous for its burnt ends. But um, spare ribs or baby back ribs, uh, I got a, a picture here soon that kind of explains the difference between the two. But again, these are these intercostal muscles that attach to each rib. And so they're always being used. So if you just throw these out on a grill, high heat, they're going to be pretty tough. They're going to be really tough. So you can do two methods of the smoking. Where we do the low, slow and low on these guys. Or what some people will do to speed up the process is they'll cook them in liquid first and then finish them on the grill. And basically when we talk about cooking them in liquid, what we're doing is it's the same phenomenon that happens inside your crock pot when you're doing uh, a roast over the winter time is that moisture is breaking down that connective tissue. That connective tissue inside that uh, at roast, inside those muscles, excuse me there, it's a collagen and it's very water soluble. And so that moisture is breaking it down. Now, when we do the slow and low, we're essentially what we're doing is overcooking it to the point where we're getting, we're denaturing that guy as well. So you can do two methods. If you want to do it a little bit quicker, you could probably cook it in liquid first and then finish it on the grill to get that nice kind of uh, grilled charred flavor. Or you can do the slow and low as well. Most of your, your rib enthusiasts are not going to do the cooking liquid first. They're going to do the slow and low. And you also your rib enthusiasts will tell you the ribs, you know it's done when the ribs are loose. Uh, it's overdone when you can actually pull the rib out. So some folks like the rib where it's loose they can cut individual ribs and they can still bite into it pull the meat off of the rib but the meat will still stay on the rib so they there's folks that like that kind of stuff if you're into adding the barbecue sauce on there 
Put that at the end. Most of our barbecue sauces are high in sugar, uh, high in molasses as well. And that will burn really easily. So that's why you always put that at the end. So what a lot of people will do, will do a rub. And I got a recipe, a recipe that we use quite a bit here in the meats lab for rubs at the, that's towards the end of this presentation that you can put a rub on there. And then some of your Memphis style ribs will not only have the rub on there, but then they'll come there at the back and put a little bit of barbecue sauce on there as well. I've seen that in Memphis as well. But ribs, fun. Got to take a ton though. You know, it's not one of those things. You could probably start them in the morning and have them for dinner that evening. It's it's good, slow and low. Get that nice smoky flavor on there as well. So when you go to the grocery store, 99% of the time you're going to see this guy right here, just your traditional spare rib. It has the sternum on here. All right. If I cut that off and get kind of just a long rectangle shape, we call that a St. Louis style rib. And then the baby back ribs, these, these are, these are, oh, oh, let me go back up here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Baby back ribs. So if you're thinking about anatomy, they would be right up here where the writing is on the spare rib. They're off of the loin up here. So that we're on C. They're off the loin. So if I make a boneless loin, the ribs that I have in there, those are baby back ribs when I make a boneless loin. They tend to be a little bit meatier, a little bit leaner uh than your spare ribs all right uh they're the more more popular style ribs here in the u.s as well and then you get uh closer to the shoulder we get what we call a country style rib where there's maybe a couple ribs in there maybe a shoulder blade in there but it's mainly a lot of meat in there those you could if you got your heat low enough you could grill those because there's a lot of loin muscle in there but some people that uh just want something meatier and don't want to mess with the, the the messy face and the barbecue face, we'll go for the country style ribs. Uh, and we also have a beef country style rib as well that's boneless that works uh, for uh, those folks as well. So both pork ribs and beef ribs become really popular as well. Treat them the same way, slow and low for a long period of time and get your dry rub on there. And if you want to come back in with a, with a wet rub or they're called wet style ribs, you can do that as well. And whether you like the St. Louis style or the spare ribs or the baby back, that's a personal preference as well there. Um, at the end of the month, we're here in May, at the end of the month, uh, myself and a couple guys from the Meats Lab, we're heading to North Carolina State to help them with their barbecue school in hopes of replicating that here this fall. Uh, we're thinking about having a beta test with that with our agents, uh, our, our extension agents this fall. But one thing that, that when you get into the Carolinas, they're really big into pulled pork, all right? And this is a fun one. Uh, I've got a couple uh, Boston butts or shoulders in my, uh, in my freezer. Thaw those guys out. And you, know, you, can, you can put them, and I highly recommend this, is you brine them first. And so you got water, pickling salt, not regular salt, pickling salt, because it's a finer salt, so it goes in solution uh, a, a lot easier jar of molasses in there put that in the, in in the in the uh, product for or in the uh, brine for about 12 hours or so what you're doing is you're basically pre-marinating this guy and why do you want to do that well because you again you're overcooking this to get it to pull so you're overcooking it apply the rub that you want on there 225 degrees or less indirect heat Two to three hours of smoke if you got a smoker that's really, really, really heavy. If you go much more than about four or five hours of super heavy smoke, when I say super heavy smoke, that you open that thing up and everybody knows you're smoking. The whole neighborhood, you got smoke in your eyes, you're crying, you're sending up smoke signals. That's what I'm talking about, super heavy smoke. If you go over about five hours, that smoke will kind of go sideways on you and give you a lot more bitter flavor. So that's why we always say about two to three hours of smoke. You know that that guy is done when you can reach in there and grab that blade bone and pull that blade bone out. And it's just as clean as can be. Let it rest for about a half hour and just get you some gloves and shred it. All right. Just shred it. That's pulled pork. Comes off that Boston butt. It's about a 12, uh, 14 hour process to do that. I have some seen some people and instead of shredding it, they will shred it and then chop it to get it even finer as well. 
So this is your personal preference. I'm just a straight up pulled pork guy. I'm not real into the uh, chop, but some people like the chop as well. Beef brisket. Uh, you know, you, you know you've mastered the art of barbecuing when you can make a really good beef brisket. It is a challenging one. I haven't quite figured this one out yet. I'm, I've been, like I said, been in contact with a colleague of mine down at Texas A&M University to figure out how they do it down there. I got a friend of mine, a, a, heard me mention her before at Ohio State, that is from South Texas. She's got this mastered as well. It is a big muscle locomotion. It's the big pectoral muscles that uh, in, the, in the beef animal. So they're always being used, but it is a very slow, very low temperature process. You see, I got 225 degrees, 16 to 18 hours. Uh, when you get that internal temperature, about a 190, uh, 195 in there, you know that you're, you're done. And even some people say, take that temperature up to 250. I've heard that being done as well, the, smoke, the smoking temperature up to 250. Once you get about 190, 195, you pull that brisket off. You wrap that guy in what's called peach paper or meat hugger papers. If you're, if you're searching online for that, you wrap that thoroughly in that. You put it in a, a cooler. When I say a cooler, I don't mean with ice, I mean just a cooler to keep it warm. And these competition guys, they will pull that that brisket out and wrap it in that peach paper, drop it in a cooler, six plus hours. So let it rest for six plus hours uh, to do that. And, and that just lets that meat rest in there. And those guys that do this, my goodness gracious, the, I still contend that the best brisket I've ever had has been in Texas and I've been working on it. Uh, I've been trying to use my pellet grill, which is a little bit more of a challenge because it cooks by a convection. So the air's constantly moving there. So you got to do things a little bit different there, but, but yeah, beef brisket, uh, everybody loves it. It should, you know, if you hold your finger out like that, it should droop over it. Uh, still have some moisture to it, but still have that good beefy smoky flavor as well with that smoke ring on there as well. So be, uh, uh, if you if you master beef brisket, you've got it. You're you're good to go on that. I always have to have fun with condiments. And this is one that uh, a few years ago, the Beef Council here in the state was really pushing hard is they were trying to explain to folks the phenomenon of umami. It's that sixth scent, uh, you know, sense that we have and, and our taste that we have, uh, or the fifth uh, taste we have that kind of savory taste button, all right? And and it's one of those deals where it, you pair up things that work really well together to get this umami, uh, is, this umami phenomenon happening there. And, you know, sweet flavors pair up really well with pork. That's why a lot of our barbecue sauces have molasses in there. Ketchup works wonderful for French fries. It gives you that umami effect as well. Beef, on the flip side, mushrooms and your hard cheeses, especially your blue cheese, really works well with uh, beef. And so here was a, a product that the... Uh, Beef Council a few years ago uh, uh, before the pandemic was really pushing this umami thing. And they created this thing called a blue cheese butter. Half cup of butter, half a cup of blue cheese. We got some parsley in there, some basil. Mix all that stuff together and you can see how they rolled it back up and put it back in the refrigerator, let it kind of firm up again. And then when you bring your steak out and you let it rest, you drop that guy on there. And it is amazing. And even people that don't like blue cheese enjoy this as well. And I'll never forget one time we were doing this uh, this workshop for some folks. And one guy, old farmer, stood up and he says, why are we doing this? Beef, is, beef tastes wonderful the way it is. We don't have to doctor it up with all this stuff. And he's absolutely right. But I'm not selling him beef. You know, I got to sell beef to the people who may not eat beef as much. And so if I can get them excited, then, you know, and with this umami type stuff, then we sell more beef. And so this is where you can have fun with this condiment there, uh, this blue cheese butter. I highly recommend it. Uh, uh, since the pandemic, we haven't pushed it that much. It'd be a fun one to kind of play around with as well uh, post-pandemic.
Uh, this is a recipe uh, I stole from a friend of mine at uh, NC State. Like I said, we're going out there at the end of the month to work with them on their barbecue school. The North Carolina vinegar sauce. And this just makes pulled pork explode with flavor. They use two cups of apple cider vinegar, two tablespoons of brown sugar. We've got some ketchup, hot sauce, red pepper flakes, black pepper, some kosher salt inside there. Mix it together. Very simplistic. And you got your, your pulled pork. You just put that on there. You see the, the picture there is of those squeeze bottles. This stuff is phenomenal. Really good. And this is what makes uh, North Carolina, North Carolina, when it comes to uh, pulled pork. That's one thing when you start studying uh, the barbecue regions, their barbecue sauces or their sauces are very, very different. Like South Carolina has a mustard-based sauce that's really, really good. Um, Kansas City is just that kind of tangy, spicy flavor. You know, here in uh, North Carolina, uh, as we have in this example here, it's that vinegar-based sauce, and then you get into your molasses sauces that you see in Memphis and so on. So, so if you really get studying or if you're traveling around a lot and you get to one of these barbecue regions, man, you know, try them out. You know, like I said, yes, Memphis is good for ribs. Kansas City is good for ribs. But every time I find myself in Kansas City and I'm close to one of the uh, uh, the uh, marquee uh, barbecue uh, restaurants there, Boy, those burn ins or something else. And I don't have a recipe for burn ins because I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Uh, but we'll definitely, uh, you know, try to do some research on that. Maybe have that for our, our barbecue workshop this fall as well. Uh, rubs. We've been talking a lot about rubs. We we utilize this firecracker rub. It was a rub that that um, the Missouri Pork Producers Association used a lot when I was in grad school at Mizzou. And don't let the name fool you. It, firecracker you think it's going to be hot and spicy no it's 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 really sweet you can see there's three pounds of brown or three pounds of sugar in here two pounds of brown sugar one pound of, of, of white sugar in here this works great on your your boston butts you're going to use for your pulled pork works great on your uh, pork loins uh we've used it quite a bit in some of the cookouts we've had here on campus as well it's a really really good uh, all-purpose pork rub that uh, a lot of folks uh, find really, really good and flavorful. So, so if you you don't catch it all at once here, you know, again, you can rewind and, and get, get some of these recipes down as well. One guy that we haven't talked a lot about is chicken. All right, yeah, we do grill out a lot of chicken. Um, if I'm doing just a regular chicken breast, sometimes you know, if you just throw chicken on a grill, boy, it dries out really quickly. And so, one of my favorite marinades is just your your Italian dressing. Put that in a, you know, marinate your chicken breast in Italian dressing for about an hour or so. Boy, it really holds in the flavor, really holds in the moisture as well. Uh, chicken's really easy to overcook. We've gotten to the point where uh, some people will just overcook chicken because they're just nervous about it. Uh, but don't overcook it. Don't overcook it. You kind of use the same uh, methods for degree of doneness for beef and pork that we, we can for chicken. Um, there's a lot of rubs you can put on there. Uh, a lot of grocery stores have poultry rubs that you can put on there. Barbecue again, the same uh, the same thing goes with uh, uh, with barbecue that we did for ribs to put that stuff there on the end. And that beer butt chicken that's it was a popular thing about 10, 12 years ago. I still think it's kind of popular now. Is where you basically take a whole chicken, you you uh, you you set it on top of a uh, a can of beer, and you just basically let that. You cook it with that that beer kind of bubbling through there and penetrating the uh, uh, the meat inside there. It's supposed to be really good. I've not tried it. Uh, I'm interested in trying it, uh, but it looks like it looks pretty fun. It really does uh, uh, to do that kind of stuff as well. Bratwurst, uh, we would I would fail you if we didn't mention bratwurst. It's one of our favorite tailgating foods, whether we're at a football game or NASCAR race. Uh, the one issue I see with bratwurst a lot of times is twofold. All right, number one, people use a fire that's way, way, way too hot for bratwurst. And that's when you see the uh, casing split in half and you end up with a grease fire because, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of fat inside these bratwurst as well. So make sure you're using a lower temperature for your bratwurst. Use tongs to move them, not stab them with a fork. Uh, and that releases all those juices out of there as well. Don't overcook them. All right. That's a that's a thing is you got to be careful with not overcooking these guys. 
Uh, you'll see sometimes in the instructions on bratwurst packages, you don't necessarily have to do this, especially if you're using a lower heat, is you need to make sure that you uh, use a lower heat. You don't have to boil them first. You really don't have to boil them first. Uh, but if you use that lower heat, you don't run into this thing called case hardening, where we, we cook them at such a high temperature that the casing that they set in, uh, it becomes really tough and chewy to bite through. We lower that temperature, cooking temperature down, and we take our time cooking them. We don't have those issues with case hardening. You always have to have a condiment with this. Uh, uh, apple kraut is one of my favorites to pair with uh, bratwurst. Basically, all I do is take an apple, cut it up, uh, saute it in some butter, add some B Bavarian sauerkraut. The Bavarian sauerkraut is a sweeter uh, uh, sauerkraut. Put that uh, mix those two together, let them kind of, the flavors meld together as well. And you see, we get kind of that, that tan color there is when you know it's good. Pair that with your bratwurst. Uh, trust me, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Uh, but bratwurst is another one of those uh, favorites that people like to cook out as well. Hamburgers, you know, again, if I said I would be uh, remiss about talking about uh, bratwurst, I would really be, if, you know, remiss talking about grilling and hamburgers. We got to have that. But you can see the hamburger looks good. We got to talk about this. That looks really good. But is there a way that we can spice up that hamburger? Let's look at that. Well, what if we did a stuffed burger where instead of the cheese being on the outside of the burger, we put cheese on the inside of the burger? Uh, here's one with blue cheese on the inside. You're saying, how do you do that? It's really easy. You just take two patties, put your cheese in the middle and kind of meld them together and they'll cook like that. This is a Minnesota favorite. This is called the Juicy Lucy. Um, Minneapolis, Minnesota is where it is from. Uh, there's two bars that fight over the ownership or the uh, the authenticness of uh, of the Juicy Lucy. Matt's Bar and the Five Eight Club uh, both claim that they're the original to the, uh, to the Juicy Lucy, but it's that stuffed cheeseburger that that uh, folks like to play around with. I've seen them where uh, taking, you know, instead of doing cheddar or blue cheese, uh, you can use Swiss cheese with mushrooms. You know, uh, those work well. Again, the, this, the mushrooms pair really well with beef. Here's cheddar and chopped bacon, you know. Um, so you put your bacon on the inside, you know, the real bacon bits work well. If you want to cook your own bacon and crumble it in there or cheddar and jalapenos as well. So all those guys work better for those stuffings and, and they're, they're fun to play around with. Again, you got to take your time cooking these guys because we got to make sure that not only the cheese melts in the middle, but all the meat gets cooked as well. And with that, are there any questions? I guess I'm just talking to Keenan and, and candy. <laughs> so. Well, we got this recorded. Yeah, the uh, recipes of people. Well, I guess if there are no questions, then we will uh, let everyone go, enjoy their lunch. Um, Again, thank you all for attending today. And this video will is recorded. Actually, I'll stop the recording now. And then 